Ok. Ok, now. This is the time for the session of uh, the Arnold proof threshold and mark signatures. So I'm, my name is Takeshi Koshiba. I'm chairing the first half of the session. So the other half is will be chaired by Ron Steinfeld. So the first talk is PR Oram. The speaker is uh, David Heath. Go ahead. Okay, um, so in this talk, I just want to give a very brief introduction to our new construction, which we call ProRAM. So as the title says, ProRAM is a so-called fast authenticated shares based zero knowledge ORAM. So in this, in this brief overview, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. What's the setting and what is that we do with this work? What kind of efficiency does our construction have? So let's go ahead and get started. So the setting we consider is interactive zero knowledge proofs. And of course, we all know what this is, but very briefly, the idea is that uh, zero knowledge is an interactive protocol between two parties, a prover and a verifier, who agree on some public statement that the prover claims to be true. And as evidence to this fact, she has some witness, which she would like to remain private. So zero knowledge protocol allows the prover and verifier to interact, at the end of which the verifier becomes convinced uh, with high probability that it must be the case that the statement is true but learns nothing additional about the witness. Um, now, as, as a community, we know a lot of proof systems for expressing arbitrary proofs. Uh, in particular, we know a lot about expressing proofs in terms of circuits or constraint systems, where the circuit is in a, a Boolean or arithmetic logic of some sort. And, but more recently, uh, some line of work has looked into, can we step up the expressivity of these statements? So what do I mean by this? So one thing you might like to be able to do is instead of having a circuit as the way that you express your statements, you'd like to have some kind of high level program written a high level programming language, like something like C. And the reason you might wanna do this is first of all, because this allows you to compose very complicated statements. Whereas with ordinary circuits, it can be quite difficult. Uh, to make very large proof statements. And also by having high level programming languages as the language that you write your statements, uh, this makes this systems more amenable to non-cryptographers that they can start to get involved in zero knowledge. Now, building a large zero knowledge CPU of this kind uh, is a large task, but one of the central components that you really need to, to get right is that your zero knowledge CPU needs to make frequent access to some kind of main memory. So your CPU has a main memory inside and it's going to very frequently update the state of this main memory. And so it's important that this main memory run efficiently. So that's really what this work is about is constructing a fast zero knowledge main memory. So we call this new construction program. Again, it's a, it's a new uh, zero knowledge RAM uh, for, for a private coin protocol. Uh, we call it a uh, program using ORAM because of the connections to the, to the uh, fundamental oblivious RAM problem. And then we integrated this new ZK RAM into a full zero knowledge proof system, by which I mean you can express proofs as uh, arithmetic circuits with you know, multiplication and addition gates, but also access to a main memory. And the cru crucial efficiency prop property that we get is that our zero knowledge proof system is based on oblivious transfers only. And we require only two log N OTs for each RAM access. So it's very efficient this way. Um, just to give you a very, very high level idea what's going on, the crucial problem that needs to be solved in the zero knowledge RAM is authenticity. How do, we, how do we force the prover to pick an element from RAM that is dictated by the proof statement itself and is not something she just grabs by her own accord? Uh, you know, a cheating prover might attempt to forge some value in the RAM. So the problem here is that intuitively what, what's going on in the RAM is that each element of the RAM is, is, is encrypted by some mask that was chosen by the verifier, right? And each, each element of RAM has a distinct mask and yet at runtime, the prover has to be able to go select a particular arbitrary element from the RAM. So the crucial problem really becomes one of aligning masks properly. How do we allow the prover to look up the right value with the right mask and still get things to work correctly? And our key idea to solving this is to introduce new kinds of zero knowledge gates that allow the prover to uh, obliviously manipulate the masks inside the circuit 
without ever learning what the masks are. She can't learn the mask, otherwise that will allow her to cheat. And by allowing her to manipulate the mask, she permutes the mask into a favorable order, which allows for very fast RAM lookups. So this is a very high level look at ProRAM. Again, ProRAM is a new zero knowledge uh, RAM uh, that requires only logarithmic number of oblivious transfers per access and is very efficient. So we implemented this and we can do you know, on the order of tens of thousands of, of accesses per second. So with that, I'll conclude and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh... Are there any questions or comments? I didn't say earlier, but you can put your questions into Zoom or Zulip or just unmute yourself to ask questions if you prefer. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, hmm. uh, should we wait? for a few minutes? No, you might as well go ahead. Okay. The next talk is complex sigma particle for bilinear group arithmetic circuit. The speaker is uh, Thomas Atema. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Can you see my screen now? Okay, good. Yes. Okay, perfect. So thanks. Uh, this is uh, joint work uh, with my co-authors Ronald Kahner and Mathieu Rambeau on uh, compressed sigma protocols for bilinear group arithmetic circuits. So on a very high level, uh, the, the problem that we're considering is uh, zero knowledge proof systems for general constraint satisfiability. So basically what we want to do is we want to develop a protocol for proofing knowledge of a commitment opening X such that x is f constrained. So basically it satisfies f of x equals zero for some arbitrary function f. And uh, we want to do this with low communication complexity. <clears throat> so typically the computation model that is considered is the arithmetic circuit model. This means that the function f is expressed as an arithmetic circuit. Um, and uh, uh, so, so basically the, the constraint is captured by an arithmetic circuit. Um, however, sometimes this computation model uh, is not the most natural approach. So this problem was also addressed in the previous talk by, uh, by David, uh, where he, he considered more high level programming languages instead of uh, arithmetic circuits. However, instead of considering higher level programming languages, we will uh, consider the bilinear group uh, arithmetic circuits model. So these uh, bilinear group circuits, they are defined over a bilinear group, obviously. And a bilinear group is uh, or contains three groups of prime order Q, uh, G1, G2, and GT, that are connected via this uh, bilinear mapping, this uh, pairing. And uh, a bilinear uh, group circuit uh, is just, as, just like an arithmetic circuit, it contains wires and gates. However, now the wire values uh, can be elements of set Q, G1, G2, and GT. So instead of only considering field elements, we now have a more uh, general class of uh, wires in these um, uh, circuits. And also the gates in a bilinear group arithmetic circuit contain uh, obviously the uh, standard arithmetic operations. So uh, field uh, multiplications and additions, but also group operations such as exponentiations and bearings. So, um, oh, sorry. So this, uh, this computation model is, uh, is, is, is a more general class uh, of circuits than, uh, than the arithmetic circuit uh, model. So it is known that any bilinear group arithmetic circuit can be expressed as an arithmetic circuit. So in principle, it's the, there, there's no need to consider this uh, more general class of circuits. However, this reduction or this translation uh, can increase the size of the circuit. 
So for example, if we consider a highly optimized group, so for a very specific instantiation, a single exponentiation can already result in uh, an arithmetic circuit of approximately uh, 800 set Q multiplication gates. So we start with the bilinear group arithmetic circuit that contains only one gate, a single group exponentiation, and then we reduce it to a, an arithmetic circuit containing 800 uh, uh, operations, 800 gates. So this blow up can be uh, significant. And um, also this blow up or this translation um, is specific or uh, yeah, it depends on the, ex, uh, the uh, bilinear group. So uh, in general, this, this, this blow up can be even much larger. So what we do in this work is we construct a direct approach for communication efficient zero knowledge proofs for constraints captured by these bilinear group arithmetic circuits. So uh, we, we, we develop a direct approach that avoids this reduction to arithmetic circuits. And uh, what we do is we uh, generalize the compressed sigma protocols that were developed for the arithmetic circuit model to this uh, bilinear circuit model. So uh, again, we avoid this reduction. And also we improve the concrete efficiency over a prior work that also considers such a direct approach with approximately a factor three. And an application of this uh, zero knowledge proof system, we construct a transparent and succinct threshold signature scheme. So to summarize the, the result is uh, a compressed sigma protocol for these bilinear group factors. So the secret factor X is uh, a factor with coefficients in ZQ, G1, G2, and GT. And uh, the, the, the compressed sigma protocol, so the zero knowledge proof system, has communication costs that are logarithmic in the dimensions N0, N1, and N2, but linear in the dimension MT. And the reason for this linear communication complexity in MT is that our main building block is a homomorphic and partially compact commitment scheme for bilinear group factors. So that basically means that the commitment scheme that we are using has commitments for which the size is independent of N0, N1, and N2. So it is compact in these first three dimensions, but the size of the commitment scheme is linear in NT. So um, this is what this uh, linear communication cost um, causes. So as an application of the zero knowledge proof system, we construct a threshold signature scheme. And um, in contrast to, to the more standard approaches for threshold signature schemes, our threshold signature is a zero knowledge proof of knowledge for K out of N signatures. So we have N part players in total. And uh, uh, if we have K out of N signatures, then we can construct this zero knowledge proof and that will uh, constitute our threshold signature. The ingredients of this threshold signature scheme are the BLS signature scheme. And uh, this uh, scheme is defined over a bilinear group and has a very small bilinear group verification circuit. So this matches very well with our uh, compressed sigma protocols for uh, bilinear group arithmetic relations. Um, uh, because we have this, uh, this new zero knowledge proof system, we do not have to translate this uh, um, yeah, bilinear group uh, constraint uh, to an arithmetic circuit. Uh, we also need to have uh, to, to get uh, this threshold, k out of n threshold functionality. And for that, we use a recent technique uh, introduced at crypto uh, this year, uh, proofs of partial knowledge. And uh, the properties of this threshold signature scheme are that the signatures are of size logarithmic in N. Uh, the setup is transparent, so we don't have a trusted setup. And also the threshold signature hides the identities of the K signers. Uh, thanks, this was my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. If there are any. Yeah, I, I yeah, have a question. Okay. Hello, Thomas. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, sorry, I'm wondering whether, like, how exactly does this model of computation that you uh, suggest is by linear group uh, arithmetic circuit, how does it relate to gross high like pairing equations? Because it seems that in both cases, you do compute something in the G1 and G2, and then you have a bunch of pairings. And um, so, what, how does it compare to gross high, if you know? So, sorry, how does it compare to what? I, I didn't uh, to, to gross a high kind of uh, NISIC, which also operates over pairing equations. 
So, so basically, uh, so all, all kinds of constraints that are well, well defined over a bilinear group with, with pairing equations can be captured by such a circuit. So this, this, this generalizes, um, uh, for example, uh, these, these, these inner pairing products uh, or, or yeah, all kinds of systems that uh, um, are defined over a bilinear group or constraints. Okay. I mean, okay. yeah, to me, it seems very similar, but I, yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much for the talk. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. So let's move to the next speak, next talk. So next talk is hmm, Promise Sigma Protocol, how to construct efficient threshold ECDSA from encryption based on class groups. The speaker is Jin Zan Chan. Okay, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for introduction. Uh, here I'm going to talk about our paper about uh, threshold ECDSA. Uh, firstly, as we know, threshold signature allows parties to share the ability of signing, and uh, threshold ECDSA is the threshold version of traditional ECDSA. The latter has been widely used in various applications, and uh, in our paper, we put forward several new techniques to construct uh, efficient two-party ECDSA and multi-party ECDSA. And uh, here, due to the shortage of time, we only introduced the case of uh, the construction of two-party ECDSA to show our techniques. Okay, uh, as the construction of two-party ECDSA, uh, progress uh, schemes usually require party one to encrypt its signing key using the homomorphic encryption and uh, using uh, their knowledge proof to ensure they behave honestly. As for the choice of homomorphic encryption, the scheme in Lidl 17 uh, chose uh, Pilios encryption. It uh, needs an expensive their knowledge proof due to the mismatch between the Pilios space and the uh, ECDSA space. In CCL ST19 and 20, they chose CL encryption. It also needs an expensive their knowledge proof uh, all an efficient their knowledge proof, but based on non-standard assumptions. So as we can see, the their knowledge proof for encryption, uh, encryption used in provides construction are uh, either expensive or based on non-standard assumptions. So in our paper, we put forward a new uh, ZK protocol. We call it a promise sigma protocol. It is efficient and uh, doesn't rely on any assumption. Uh, however, our protocol only satisfy a kind of weak soundness, uh, but uh, we found such a security is enough for the construction of uh, threshold ECDSA. Uh, more, spe uh, more specifically, we put forward a new technique to simulate homomorphic operations on an irreducible text, which has been provided, uh, which has been proved by our uh, promise sigma protocol. Uh, our protocol is also based on CL encryption. It is a homomorphic encryption based on class group with a DLEZ subgroup. And it is similar with the famous algorithm encryption, except that it chooses the public key from an unknown order group and uh, it uses an extra element from a DLEZ group to, in to encrypt messages. Here we note that CL mat is the lord element in this uh, class group. Therefore, the common schema protocol for, uh, for CL encryption is not secure unless the welfare choose the challenge from the set of zero or the one. There are all the non standard assumption, the low order assumption, and the strong root assumption hold. Uh, fortunately, we found uh, this protocol still satisfy a somewhat security. It implies that the sediment C can be easily turned into a video super text. Uh, in other words, uh, the statement C is uh, close to our uh, encryption, and uh, one could extract the message uh, only using the secret key. Uh, but here we still need to ensure the consistency of the extract message and the message hiding C. 
So we use algorithm encryption and uh, CR encryption to encrypt the same message and parallelize the Sigma protocols for algorithm and uh, CR encryption. Uh, that's our first idea, the promise Sigma protocol. It uh, satisfies the uh, understood Wi-Fi zero knowledge policy and uh, uh, kind of weak soundness. We call it the uh, promise extractability. It claims that uh, using rewinding, one could uh, extract the message and the randomness uh, uh, of the algorithm encryption. And uh, without rewinding, one could use both secret keys to extract the message encrypted in uh, algorithm encryption. Uh, here, because our protocol uh, can't ensure the readiness of the CL encryption, so we might make trouble uh, in the security proof of our thread called ECDSA. So we put forward another technique to show how to simulate the homomorphic options on an invalidated subtext, which has been proved by Promise Sigma protocol. And uh, using these techniques, we construct an efficient two-party uh, ECDSA and uh, and uh, efficient multi-party thread hold ECDSA compared with the schemes uh, appeared in CISST 19 and 20. Our schemes behaves much better. Uh, and our multi-party scheme uh, also removes a lot of assumption and the strong root assumption. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Okay. If, uh, are there any questions or comments? You may use chat box. Okay, no question. So thank you. Thank you for the speaker. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Thank you. Let's move to the next talk. Now, the chair is, from now, the chair is by Ron Steinfeld. Thank you, Takeshi. Um, so uh, we can move now to the, the next talk for this uh, session, which is titled uh, The One More Discrete Logarithm Assumption in the Generic Group Model by Balthazar Bauer, Jörg Fuschbauer, and Antoine Pluvies. And the speaker will be Balthazar. Hi. Uh, you can go ahead. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes. OK. Uh, Uh, so, so, hello everyone, uh, I'm Balthazar Boer and I'm happy to present you uh, the one more discrete logarithm in the generic group model, a joint work with Georg Fuchsbauer and Antoine Pouvier. So, in this work, uh, we analyze the one more discrete logarithm uh, assumption and show it holds in the generic group model. So uh, also this assumption has been uh, introduced almost 20 years ago and uh, um, is widely used in the literature. Uh, there has been no um, such proof uh, before our work. Um, and in fact, uh, we prove that the only uh, proof sketch uh, in the literature uh, is flawed. So first, I would like to explain you what this assumption is. So in uh, this context, there is an adversary uh, which receives uh, group elements. He has to compute uh, the discrete logarithms. Uh, and he has access uh, to an oracle, she can compute the discrete logarithm of uh, the group elements of his choice. So at this step, the problem can seem uh, trivial, but to win, the adversary 
should que should uh, ask uh, should make fewer uh, queries to this uh, discrete logarithm oracle than the number of challenges. Um, hence uh, the name one more uh, discrete logarithm. So this uh, assumption has been uh, introduced by Bellary et al. in 2003. And uh, as you can see, it has been uh, used a lot in the literature. Uh, for uh, example, uh, um, it underlies the security of uh, blind Schnorr signatures. And it's also used uh, in, for uh, the security of other uh, primitives, uh, such as uh, the multi-signatures uh, music 2. The multi-signatures scheme uh, music 2. Uh, and it has also a theoretical interest because um, many negative results are based on this assumption. Uh, for example, uh, uh, some um, security properties uh, uh, can not be based, for some security properties of the Schnorr signatures can not be based on the discrete logarithm assumption if the one more discrete logarithm assumption holds. So it's uh, obvious that uh, this assumption is stronger than the discrete logarithm assumption. Uh, and, but uh, we, we don't know at this step if this assumption is relevant or not because uh, the crypto analysts uh, do not study this assumption as much as the discrete logarithm uh, assumption. But because we are in a group context, uh, we would like to have, as a minimal uh, sanity check, uh, the guarantee that generic attacks does not break this assumption. So, to have this guarantee, we have to study uh, this assumption in the generic group model. So, briefly, uh, in this model, the adversary does not have access to the real encodings of the group elements, but only see purely random symbols which correspond to these group elements. And if you want to make a group operations, a group operation, he has to uh, interact with an oracle. She computes the group operation for him and output the new random symbol which correspond to, uh, this, uh, to the result of this uh, group operation. So, in most of uh, the previous proof in the generic group model, uh, people uh, were using the schwartz lemma, but unfortunately, uh, this lemma does not apply uh, here. Uh, for this reason, we have introduced a new algebraic lemma which perfectly fits with our goal. Uh, and by using this lemma, we finally prove uh, the security of the one more discrete logarithm uh, uh, in the generic group model. Um, and uh, by using similar arguments, we have also proved that uh, variants of the one more discrete logarithm, such as the one more uh, CDH assumption, uh, holds also in the generic group model. So I would like uh, to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I would be happy to answer it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I have some questions. Um, firstly, uh, have you tried to also prove it in the algebraic group model? Uh, but uh, you mean based on which assumption? I don't know, maybe like discrete logarithm? Oh, uh, we know it's okay. Um, we know it's not possible. Uh, there is a negative result about that in a, a, a paper of uh, uh, crypto in uh, two, uh, 2020, uh, which uh, shows that uh, 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 there is, uh, fine, 
we cannot uh, prove the security of uh, one more discrete uh, uh, the one more discrete log assumption uh, based on the uh, discrete log uh, assumption. It's not possible. There is a separation result. Yeah. Right. Uh, and my second question would be like, what is the problem of using SWAT simple lemma? Why does it? Why can't we use? Uh, it? Okay. So um, the problem is the fact that the discrete logarithms. Uh, so it's complicated. So in the Schwarz simple lemma. Uh, you com if you do the proof rigorously, uh, you use polynomials, and at the end, uh, you uh, you choose the value for the in, uh, for uh, the xi. But when you do that, uh, it's at the end of the interaction between uh, the adversary and the challenger. And here you cannot do that because the challenger can query discrete logarithm uh, calls. Then um, uh, you you have you need to uh, to uh, choose uh, at, during the interaction. You need to choose values for uh, unknown uh, during the interaction, and then he. Uh, it changes a lot of things uh, because uh, you cannot just use the Schwarzschild lemma at the end uh, and uh, and uh, just look the probability that no collision occurs because uh, the adversary has some information uh, on the value. So I think uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. It's, um, Okay. Oh, I, I see the thing. Why it might be hard. Thank you. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Mm. I guess I have a naive uh, question. All right. So, yeah. do you believe that these problems are equivalent? The discrete log is a one more discrete log? What do you mean by equivalent? There's a reduction. Do you think there's a reduction in the reverse direction? Uh, no, I don't think so because uh, in the, the, the result in the algebraic model, let's think uh, from a theoretical aspect, there is a gap uh, between these two problems. Um, but it does not mean, uh, uh, yeah, fin, maybe. From a practical point of view, uh, their uh, hardness is, is the same. But uh, uh, yeah, I think fi finding a reduction, uh, uh, a generic reduction, uh, seems to me very uh, hard for me. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll ask also one more question. Um, do you think uh, technique can be generalized to, to, to a wider class of techniques um, besides the one for this particular? So Sorry, I didn't hear you well. Oh. Um, do you think your technique, uh, your proof technique can be generalized to, to a wider Problems like um, just uh, one more discrete log. Uh, so can you write your question on the chat? <laughs> because I didn't hear you. Well, I don't know if it's my connection which is low. Um. Yeah, I thought it was this one. Oh, uh, so, hmm. uh, so, 
I think it can be generalized for any type of uh, one more assumptions. So, but uh, the one more, enfin, one more assumption in, in a group context. So, of course, this uh, proof is only useful in a group context. So, it cannot be used for uh, one more uh, RSA, for example. Uh, but um, yes, uh, it, we, we in our paper we show that it can be applied for a variant of the one more uh, discrete logarithm, which is the one more CDH, mm -hmm. uh, and we can extend, still extend to uh, uh, this uh, result. Uh, but um, uh, the new result covered by this type of proof uh, are not uh, for example, the one more CDH has not been, enfin, we defined, has not, never been used in the literature. So I don't see uh, 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 results which are uh, important, which can which can be now covered by this uh, pr proof. I, I just don't see toy game, you know, uh, toy, uh, but not uh, important uh, assumptions. Yeah, I see. Yeah, okay. I see. Okay. Uh, I think we may move. Uh, Ronnie, uh, your audio is breaking up. Oh. Um, let me see if I can improve it. You might turn your camera off. Yeah, okay. Uh, is it better now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you both for that. We move to the next sure. uh, paper in this mission, which is titled Verifying Extractable One Way Function and the Applications Subversion Zero Knowledge. Um, and this book is uh, Arne Tobias Odegaard. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? And see my Thank screen? You, Arne. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I'm here to talk about our paper, Verifiably Extractable One Way Functions and Our Applications to Subversion Zero Knowledge. And this is joint work with Prestudi, Helger, Janu, and Michal. Um, so our starting point is non-interactive zero knowledge or NISIC in the CRS or common reference string model. So the setup is that the uh, prover, in this case a cat, you know, has access to some public, wants to prove some public statement X to be true and has some private witness uh, you know, that testifies to this fact, uh, wants to convince you know, a verifier that the statement uh, is true. Uh, and wants to do so by sending a single message uh, or proof uh, and we want there to be no further interaction uh, between the prover and verifier. Uh, and the common way to do this is that we assume the existence of a trusted third party that generates a common reference string and shares it between the prover and the verifier. And then the uh, CRS is used to create a proof and to verify a proof. And if the third party behaves honestly, then we can achieve you know, the three properties we care about, completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge. Completeness saying that an honestly generated proof is accepted. Soundness saying that a uh, proof of a false statement is not accepted. And zero knowledge stating that the proof doesn't reveal anything um, additional about the statement beyond the fact that it is true. Importantly, it doesn't reveal anything about the witness W. But these properties uh, rely importantly on the trust in the third party, we need the third party to behave honestly. And um, if uh, the third party doesn't behave honestly, then we have no uh, guarantees, uh, typically. So what we would like is to have some guarantees uh, in case the third party behaves maliciously. Could we still guarantee you know, zero knowledge or soundness or complete completeness if the third party behaved maliciously? Um, so we cannot guarantee all three properties. Um, so if the um, 
so we use uh, the phrase subversion soundness or CK uh, to talk about you know the soundness property would remain uh, even if the CRS was subverted. So subversion soundness means that we don't have to trust the uh, CRS generator to have soundness. We have soundness regardless. Uh, if this property is achieved by our protocol, then we cannot have zero knowledge at all, even if we trust the CRS generator for that property. Uh, so that would be impossible. Uh, it is possible to achieve a weaker privacy requirement uh, in this setting, uh, but that's not our focus. So our focus is on uh, subversion zero knowledge and ordinary soundness. So uh, the idea is that we want zero knowledge property to remain even if the CRS is subverted. Uh, and then we want the soundness property to remain if the uh, CRS generator was being honest. Uh, so in that case, we were able to reduce the trust in the CRS generator. So there are some constructions in the literature. And the key question of our paper is under which assumptions can uh, this properties uh, be achieved? So can subversion zero knowledge NISX be achieved? Uh, so our contributions are well, three or fourfold. So we define a new primitive, which we call a verifiably extractable one-way functions or a VEOFs, um, which is a yeah, not very nice acronym, but uh, uh, and we give some constructions of this primitive, or more precisely, we show that various constructions in the literature are you know satisfy our definition. Uh, and then we construct sub CK NISX from VEOFs with some additional primitives, and we construct VEOFs from sub CK NISX under certain additional conditions. Um, so we, oops. so we show that there is a, you know, significant connection between subseq and ASIC and the offs. Uh, so I'll just briefly define what the off is. So, uh, like verifiably extractable one-way functions is uh, an extension of the uh, non-primitive extractable one-way functions. Uh, so an extractable one-way function satisfies, uh, you know, the one-way property. So this is traditional. Um, you know, given an image of a function, it should be hard to compute a pre-image. And extractable, uh, meaning given access to, like white box access to an adversary, uh, which computes an image of a function, it should be possible to like extract a pre-image from this adversary. Uh, so these two properties define an extractable one-way function. We add on the property of image verifiability, um, where it should be possible to like verify efficiently and publicly whether some value belongs to the image uh, of the function. And so we have some constructions. Uh, so in a restricted model, but from very nice assumptions, uh, like things called delegation schemes, uh, the con like construction of uh, BCPR um, uh, gives you a, a way off. Uh, we also have, um, you know, like from knowledge of exponent assumptions uh, with pairings, we get the offs knowledge analytics and heuristics uh, signature schemes. Um, the idea being that someone who's able to sign messages should know the secret key uh, is sort of the idea there. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. So please watch the full talk uh, and read the paper if you're interested, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Arne. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Uh, no. Um, so, uh, can I ask a question? Um, sure. Um, so you have this uh, su su subversion zero knowledge construction from these uh, special one-way functions. Mm -hmm. Efficiency of your zero knowledge protocol compared to uh, to those constructions that are based on concrete uh, knowledge assumptions. Um, they're similar, um, like. But yeah, like they have similar efficiency, I would say, like asymptotically, uh, no concrete improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there is no big overhead, like? No, uh, yeah, there is some constant overhead. Uh, um, you need to like 
um, essentially evaluate a bigger circuit, um, but uh, no massive overhead. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, ah, there is another. There is oh. another question by Ray Dai on the chat. So, do you think we could add subversion? Yeah. Directly to any NISC. Um, I think it's um, it's a bit tricky. Uh, I think. Um, so we actually show you can like so our approach works if you have a perfect zero knowledge um, and some additional property uh, then we can like um, add subversion zero knowledge generically but i think in general it's a bit uh, like you need some sort of you need some structure to the crs essentially to be able to like check you know that it um, sort of looks nice um, and i think Generically, to any NISIC is a bit, uh, bit tricky. Okay, good. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, no, doesn't look like it. So, yeah, thank you, Arne. Um, so, we'll move on to the next talk, the last talk for this session, which is um, titled Chain Reductions for Multi-Signatures HBMS Scheme by Mihir Peller and Wei Dai, and the speaker is Wei Dai. Thanks for the introduction. Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'll start. So my talk is on chain reduction of multi-signatures and the HBMS scheme, and this is joint work with Mihir Bellari. So uh, multi-signatures allow a group of signers to collectively endorse on a common message with a short signature. Uh, we want independent key generation by every single party. This means that we, we don't want them to have to run uh, a key generation uh, protocol. And signing, it's, it's a multi-round protocol between any group of signers taking in inputs on message and the list of signers to eventually output a signature, which will require to be short, meaning that it should be, um, it, it, it should not depend on the length of the, the number of parties. And verification takes in the list of parties, a message and a signature to, to return a Boolean value. And additionally, we ask for uh, optionally key, key generation as a feature, which means that there should be algorithm taking in input a list of public keys to output the short aggregate public key. And against this, uh, again, this uh, aggregated public key, there should be a verification that um, takes in the aggregated public key instead of the list of keys. So here's a brief history on uh, multi signatures. It was first kind of proposed back in the 80s and the earlier constructions on multi-signatures were uh, insecure and susceptible to row key attacks. And, and there's the earlier approaches kind of uh, does not fit uh, what we described before. And, and, and so the more recent schemes kind of base, uh, are more based on these, um, um, the, the, the scheme by Blurry Nevin proposed in 2006, which is a DL based scheme that was stayed secure in the plain public key model. And more recently, within the past uh, three or four years, there's been a resurgence of interest on multi-signature due to their application blockchain settings, in particular uh, to multi-signature wallets and as well as to, in this consensus setting, to generate short certificates of finalized states. And, and in this setting, we want uh, uh, this particular list of features. And we want efficient multi-signature schemes over common inter groups without pairings. And that they should be secure uh, in the plain public key model. And I will not formally int introduce the secure notion here. And additionally, we want the two features of having uh, key aggregation, as well as the, uh, this, the uh, scheme should support two round signing. And within the past two, three years, there's been a, lo a lot of schemes that's proposed, such as uh, Music2 music and uh, also uh, DWMS. And so these are schemes that support key aggregation and have two-round signing. However, actually, it, um, these schemes do come at a cost in that their, their concrete and provable security 
uh, it's it's at contention with with the the feature that they're adding. So so let me elaborate on um, the, the the kind of the current landscape of this, and the the analogy is is really the um, uh, best summarized in a picture, and and so so here's a DL tree, uh, and there's some fruits hanging on it, and the previous work of, of this form, they said that hey look we discovered some nice fruits somehow hanging from the DL tree. Meaning that uh, they are somehow hanging from the DL tree means that there's reduction from the hardness of DL to the uh, unfortunately of the signature schemes. However, these reductions are not tight, so they're just somehow hanging on DL tree. And our results instead shows the following: we said that hey, look, so these are very uh, there's some very solid branches that attach to the main trunk of the tree, which is the uh, DL problem, and that these fruits, these schemes are actually tightly attached to the branches. Uh, by by tightly attached to the branches, I mean that um, the the security of the schemes and the hardness of the problem they're attached to are actually tightly equivalent uh, in the normal open model. And furthermore, we, add, we additionally add a scheme that is um, two rounds and supports key aggregation, and um, and is and is secure against the the kind of the the, the new assumption that we that we propose, and so here the the BN scheme and the music scheme are, are both the uh, three rounds um, schemes. So so let me get more into detail of, of, of our results. So for for BN music, which are which are both three round schemes, whereas previous results uh, in the standard model can only give us uh, eighty up to eighty six or 51 bit of security, if you instantiate it with uh, you know, groups that we use in practice, our results allows us to argue that even in, even in the standard model, there's assumptions that we can assume um, to be able to argue uh, 120 bit security. And furthermore, our results essentially yield uh, AGM proof, which is not surprising. Uh, that, that shows that the security of these schemes are, are as, um, as hard as, as DL, essentially. And in terms of two-round signature schemes, we improve on uh, the 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 kind of the the state of affairs um, compared to music two and digital MS, which are very recent schemes presented in uh, crypto this year. Our scheme uh, it's as efficient as as, as the pr prior schemes, and additionally, it's the first scheme that can be proved secure in the standard model, and uh, it is tightly secure in AGM. So. Whereas uh, music two and DWMS are not uh, the, the most efficient version of them, do, do not have standard model proofs, and the uh, AGM proofs relies on rely, uh, re reduction from OMDL, and uh, additionally the proofs are actually still st still not tight even um, with strong assumptions. So uh, our results actually say more. We can uh, claim um, that if, for for example, if BN secure, then so is music. Or if, if music secure things are as a new scheme, HBMS. And the reason why we can claim these uh, results is that uh, we give chain reductions, meaning we provide a chain of reduction from, from DL all the way to the security of the, of the scheme. And with the two important properties, the first part of, of, of the reduction, we have to make some sacrifice. So we either work in uh, the standard model, but provide a non-tight reduction, or we work in AGM and provide a tight reduction. And for the second part of the reduction, meaning from the intermediate hard problem to the security of the scheme, we do not make any compromises, meaning we make a tight reduction uh, and in standard model. And here a bit of a disclaimer, by standard model, I, I, I mean uh, real model. Uh, model. So we're not making idealized assumptions on the group. And additionally, we'll like to you know, have this intermediate problem be reusable. So, um, to kind of describe our results in, in, in one slide, this is uh, the formal uh, result that we, that we have shown. The new problem XIDL is uh, the random target identification logarithm problem, which is an extension to the IDL problem that was proposed uh, by Kiel, Sebastian, and Penn back in 2016. And from that problem, we're able to show that the hardness of that problem in a group is equivalent to the unfortunately of music, the uh, th three round version. And from there, we're also able to prove in standard model that uh, our new scheme is secure. And our new scheme, it's uh, two rounds improving upon three round virtual music. And furthermore, our new scheme is secure 
uh, tightly from DL in AGM. And with that, I think I'll uh, thank you for your attention and take questions. Thank you, uh, Wei. Thanks. Um, are there any questions for Wei or comments? Um, no. Um, uh, maybe I can ask a question. So, uh, so you have this new XIDL problem. Uh, what the known evidence for the hardness of this problem? Yeah, so in the standard model, it's by a broken lumber reduction from IDL. And for, uh, so, so, so there is a reduction from other from DL, but we, uh, so yeah, so in the standard model, we know that essentially it, it, by the two application of fork lemma, we know that it's, it's, tied, it's related to DL. And in the AGM, uh, the, we actually have a tie reduction. So, uh, I mean, the kind of gist of it is that for you know groups in practice, probably XIDL uh, should be viewed as hard uh, as, as DL because you know we we know for on the curves for, for example, um, right? So so I guess in that sense it's not at, um, not the same as OMDL, which was discussed in the previous talk uh, in the session. Uh, the 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 reduction from DL does hold in AGM, which makes it uh, a lot easier. So, so if, if the reduction holds, uh, you know, from DL in AGN, we know that it is also hard in a, a generic group model. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the reduction is tight in the AGM? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, can I also ask about the, uh, comparing your scheme, the HBMS scheme to music too. Um, so I, I, I think uh, you have some efficiency improvement versus music too. Is that uh, correct? There's or? no efficiency improvements. So compared to music too, actually, so um, the efficiency is, is relatively similar. The only difference is that. Uh, I guess it's downside of for for, for our scheme. It, so music two actually generates a short signature, so it's kind of com compatible with existing infrastructure. Whereas our scheme changes the, uh, it, it's no longer compatible with short signatures. Oh. However, so the, the the main the main gain is that we were able to prove uh, security tightly in AGM and also uh, security from um, in, in in the standard model from from DL which is not previously possible for any of the two rounds multi-signature schemes. So it was only possible for three rounds and moving to two rounds uh, with this music two and WMS, they had to sacrifice uh, essentially security to, to be able to push two rounds through. And our scheme is the first scheme that, that we argued, you know, does not sacrifice security, but still obtains two rounds. But in the process, we kind of give up on um, compatibility with Schnorr. Mm -hmm. But ah, okay. is relatively the same. Um, ah, so for music two, you cannot do any reduction in the standard. Uh, there is a reduction, I believe, for so there there are, there are schemes parameterized. So I think if you go to the previous table, um, let's see. Sorry. Uh, so so their scheme is parameterized. The 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 if the parameters are big enough, then I, I believe they they actually provide the standard model reduction uh, from OMDL. But if the parameter is small, which is you know make it more efficient, but but in that case they don't have a um, standard model reduction. They rely on AGM. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And your scheme doesn't have this parameter. Uh, okay. uh, no, right. It's okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um... So are there any other questions or? Um, no, um, looks like no other questions. So, uh, so thank you, Wei. Um, and uh, yeah, I think this concludes, this concludes uh, the session. So 
Thank you, and uh, I think in half an hour the next sessions will start. So see you then. <laughs>